I'm gonna get. Sorry, give... I just. Go ahead. I, I thought of one. He was like, "Can I kiss you?" And Viola Davis was like, <laughs> "No." <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Best Motion Picture 2011. I'm Anna, and I'm Maddie, and today we are talking about two films that are emotional. We're talking about 50-50 and Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close. Which one of these did you want to start with? Um, I think I kind of want to start with 50-50. Okay, sure. So let's start with the story. Mm -hmm. What did you give the story? I saw this in theaters. I feel a little bit differently now after, like, it's been a long time. But then also after researching it, I am going to give this story a four. I am also going to give it a four. Mm -hmm. This was my first time seeing it. It had been basically on my watch list for the last like 10, 12 years. Like I was always like, oh, I want to see it. I want to get around to it. And I like literally never did. Overall thought it was a pretty good story. I didn't realize, didn't know So I guess it makes sense that he's literally our age, he's 27, and that like, I was like, oh fuck. In my brain I was like, but I'm apparently 27 and this guy's not acting like 27 to me. Like he's acting like older, you know, he lives on his own in his house. Oh, because he was such a freaking stick in the mud. Seth Rogen was, I guess, a little more like of a normal 27 year old, you know, like people that I'm like, oh, that's. That's like literally six of my friends is like Seth Rogen where they have a job, but you know, they party or whatever, you know, right. whatever. And he wasn't like immature, whereas like JGL was like super serious, but then at the same time, he didn't even know how to drive. And I was like, are you gay or something? Just kidding. I wish that they could have explored deeper into the relationships. I feel like they just broke the surface, but like they didn't actually like deep dive into his relationship with Bryce Dallas Howard or with his mom or with Anna Kendrick. And yeah, I'm like, I, it... I was shocked at the story to runtime ratio. This is what, 97 minutes long. And I feel like yeah. they could have taken an extra 10 minutes to go into like definitely more with his mom. Cause I feel like it was hero's journey, cancer. I haven't seen 500 Days of Summer in a long time, and I know that it's probably been a while for you, but you've watched it so many more times than I have, but I was just like... Would you believe we watched it immediately after this? (laughs) Oh! (laughs) I don't know, this guy also just seems like Tom, almost, to me, because he's like a nerd, but then I know he's not like as, I don't want to say toxic as Tom, but like, I don't know, it's just Joseph Joseph Gordon Lerver. For our audience members who don't know, I've seen 500 Days of Summer many, many times. And I'll leave it at that. I think that Adam is, like, nothing like Tom. I think they could be friends at work, but not outside of work. They they listed this as, like, a romantic comedy. Um, I get it, because that is sort of what, like, the outcome is. But, uh, I would not call this, like, a romantic comedy. Reading and researching it, they, like, purposefully were, like, we are not going to show Adam and his therapist kissing because that makes it a romantic comedy and this movie is not about their relationship. It's about Adam beating cancer. My least favorite part of the story was the romantic aspect. I hated that he had a relationship with his therapist. Oh, That's got to be some sort of like breach of interest and conflict of whatever. She's not officially a doctor or whatever and she's a couple years younger than him. They probably, you know, ended their patient and therapist relationship. Yeah, I kind of wish that that like wasn't a thing at all. Did you, you, I'm sure you saw, like this movie is based on like the writer, um, Will Reeser? I, hold on, I want to make sure I'm saying Oh my god! Right. What? You, you mo- your notebook was on the microphone and you picking it up just made me go deaf and so don't put it back there. <laughs> Got it. The the writer of this film, Will Reeser, I don't know how to say his last name, but he had cancer at age 27 or whatever, and his best friend at the time was Seth Rogen. And so this movie is their movie that Seth tried to get him to write for years. No, I did not see that. This is the king's speech of this season, I suppose. It was like, well, it's written because <laughs> it was about this person, you know? I mean, overall, I, I we both gave it a four. We enjoyed the story. We liked it. Shall we move on to... The art, the vision, the performances, the directing. I'll give it, like, I 
I don't know, a four. I almost want to give it a 3.5 because it was like nothing special, but I don't feel like a three is justified. So I'm, I'll say 3.5 same so much same there was like n not a lot they had to do to get you to be involved the score was um M michael michael diatino Di 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 he did up and super uh, eight yeah. in the batman uh -huh. i don't know how to say his name i barely noticed it compared to those three other movies that i just mentioned there were certain moments that i was like if this was a different movie the score would be like coming in and swelling or doing something and it's not which i like because it doesn't like not every movie needs like the score to do such heavy lifting so I thought that also kind of spoke on like that it didn't need that because it was good on its own or, or there was one time one of the um songs that played I think when he tells Bryce Dallas Howard he has cancer I think it's Radiohead is it's high and dry which like it took me until they're literally singing don't leave me high don't leave me dry and then I was like that's a little bit on the nose don't leave me high and dry I just told you I have cancer but it's not like he put it on it was the movie's choice and then she she was a kind of villain but I think she played it very real oh what an evil bitch whenever he goes I nailed that fucking cunt woo I saw this in a nearly empty theater but every person laughed out loud at that point but I thought she d did well. Like she wasn't, she wasn't like a maniacal villain that like was plotting and play. It well, I don't know. I don't know what goes in goes into cheating, especially on a boyfriend who has cancer. But like I thought he did pretty good, like as being a guy who didn't know how to process or like didn't want to process things. Right. I think this was really great role for Joe. I think it was showing significantly more depth than he had to to play Tom Hansen. The only like other artsy thing that I noticed about this movie, Anna Kendrick always wore red and nobody else wore red. Ah. They did the same damn thing in 500 Days of Summer. One last thing I've got to mention is uh, the wig they put on Angelica Houston. I can't believe they put her in such like a Karen wig. Angelica Houston in this movie, she's like a legend. She's an icon. I love her a lot. I've never seen her just be like a normal mom. Yes, and yes, just I, a woman. I was like, she's so phenomenal. The fact that like she's like literally barely in the film and every time she's on the screen, it's powerful, dynamic, magnetic, stupendous. And that's what I wish they would have dove in like at the one point when Anna Kendrick does say she has a husband who can't talk to her and a son who won't. Like oh. I wish they would have done developed and they sort of did. They sort he he realizes it clicks for him that yeah. he does need to like talk to his mom and be there for his mom and we get a little sliver that she's been going to a cancer support group but like uh if, if there would have been more of that i feel like this really could have been taken to a next level gotten more acclaim and stuff like that yes yes it, it is shocking well no never mind L okay. let's talk about the acclaim do you want to talk about 2011 yeah sure give me one second i'm gonna take a sip of drink is that a celsius 2011. Yes. 50-50. I was aware of this movie. Like I said, I wanted to see it, but I just literally never did. It's right. been on my watch list for like 11 years. I'm giving it a four for 2011. Yeah, same. I totally didn't say a number. I agree, four. This was nominated for two Golden Globes. This made, I want to say, five times the budget. It was in a couple of top ten lists. It was, like, widely successfully, like, praised and reviewed. Even to this day on Rotten Tomatoes and Metacritic, it has high-ass reviews. The streaming service I rented it on, I think it's had the Rotten Tomatoes score. It's, like, 93 or something. I was like, okay. Yeah, yeah, it is a 93. It, and it's a 72 on Metacritic, which, like, can have, like, stinker pretentious dumbasses on it, too. I don't like anybody. It's been on the radar for a long time, and it was one of those, like, screenplays that everyone wants to make but hasn't made yet. Gotcha. Yeah. As for today? I'm gonna give it a 2.5. It's pretty irrelevant on the internet, although if you ask people, especially probably millennials and late elder Gen Zs, uh, they might they'll probably be aware of it i also don't think it's one that's necessarily hit like cult status either which would bump it up i definitely agree and i think i'm also going to go with a 2.5 basically for the exact same reasons as you what's crazy is i don't know what's going on but this is like 
of the like most known fours for Joseph, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, this is number four and not 500 Days of Summer. Granted, it's me, and I have seen 500 Days of Summer a handful of times. But I feel like everyone knows about that movie and knows like a joke or a scene or something and would recognize that movie, but not this one. Yeah, that movie, I I would say, has more internet power. People talking about Manic Pixie Dream Girls and, like, just because she listens to the Smiths, you don't have to fuck her or whatever the line is. like Doesn't make uh, her your soulmate. That's what it is. <laughs> I will say, when you Google this movie, when you Google just 50-50, this comes up. Not raffle tickets, not something else. The movie comes up first. The marginalized person's representation present in this film. Hmm. Um, a one? Yeah, a one. You know, we like to be nice every now and again, be like, well, the elderly, well, well, like, ableism, blah, blah, blah. There was not a single person in the film. The only arguable fact is that guy, BDH, cheats on him with, who you don't even see his whole face. They just say he looks like some Jesus, like, desert-looking freak. And I can say that because I'm a desert-looking freak. Well, I'm not desert looking. Yeah, not even any of the girls they like try to fuck. You know what? There None was of their co-workers. um the two, the doctor is an Asian woman. She has about okay. two lines and she's playing a mm-hmm. doctor. Yeah. You know, we talk all the time like, "Oh, you know, we don't want to only play like the sidekicks and best friends and blah 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 blah." This would have been an excellent movie that like nothing would have fucking changed if it had been about an Asian family or a Latin family or a black family. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Instead of being like, no, Seth Rogen didn't have to be true. Seth Rogen. Because Seth Rogen did have to be Seth Rogen. Because he was playing himself. And that's what it's like, oh, yeah, I mean, probably the writer or whatever, like, was white and it's based off his life. Yes, the writer, I guess, is, like, a screenwriter. But it's not, like, the Prince of England or even some fighter from Boston. He wasn't a high-profile guy before this movie. And I don't know what he's done since not to, like, knock him or anything. He but hasn't I'm just written saying, any other movies. Okay. Yes! There could have been things changed and liberties taken. You know, more of the doctors, Anna Kendrick, didn't have to be white. Or the um, old men. And then the so gayest one. thing about this movie is that he doesn't drive. Yeah. Manson Family Disclosure? No. No. Moving on to... Have you learned the title? <laughs> Extremely Tom and Incredibly Hanks? Hey. That's what my professor called it in college. This was the first time I'd seen this movie as well. I had watched this on like HBO in like 2012 or 2013. As far as like the story of this movie, and perhaps this is mean of me, but I'm being honest, I think like a 2 or a 2.5. Based on a an incredibly acclaimed book, I just think... If it's a story about 9-11, oh, I can't believe I'm about to say this, it's a cute view into 9-11. <laughs> if it's a story about family, this ain't it. If it's a story about autism, which Jonathan Safran Foer has said, like, I never thought about Oscar having autism, but go off this, I guess he does. Like, this still is- Hold on, hold on. Who said that he never thought about Oscar having autism? The director? The writer? The Who? original author of the book. You're wrong. You're so wrong and so blind to I your own them. words. We haven't even given a score yet, and that's fine. The author... No, so this is, like, a completely fictional... It wasn't like the author's dad died. These people are completely fictional victims of 9-11. Yeah, Pete Davidson okay. was not involved. Okay. Uh, okay. That makes me change my score a little bit i'm gonna be honest i'm gonna be real i cried multiple times in this movie like kind of hard but she finally cried guys (laughs) (laughs) but and i was gonna say this do i think that makes it a good slash even better movie because it made me cry absolutely not but i was probably gonna give it a four but i'm just gonna give it a three. It was kind of sloppy might be the better word because the way this was stitched together was not it. I I don't think we're that off base for being like this story is not incredible because the Rotten Tomatoes score is a 45 and the Metacritic okay. score is a 46. I feel like I should say what I kind of liked. Okay. I liked 
I thought he was a really well thought out little boy. But I, I was like, this, there's no way that they, that this character is not autistic. So the author being like, oh, I never, um, I never even considered him to be autistic. I'm like, what did you, what, how did you write? What did you, huh? Did you read what you wrote? I liked the parts of him explaining about himself and his mission and, you know, that it was about his grief. You know, him kind of like developing a relationship with his grandfather and even Sandy Bullock being like, yeah, I met all of these people before you even went there, like blah, blah, blah. I was like, that's great. But yeah. the whole thing of this mystery, I was like, what is going on? The sixth borough thing, I was like, what's the end game for you? At the very end, I was like, hold on now. At the end, when Oscar finds the little Note slip of swing. paper, uh -huh. I was like, were there other pieces to like a different little quest he didn't find? And he was so, he was locked in on this thing that like his father didn't even know. Like, did his father even know? that key was in that vase. I don't think so. That's the, and that's, I'm like, oh my God. If there was anything, there was probably, yeah, other clues that like Oscar never found and that that was the end one. I feel like that's probably stupid of me to be like focused on, but I'm like, well, that was the story though. That was Oscar thought he was going on that journey, but he didn't. Yeah. I don't know. I just want to say before we forget and before, before I forget and before we move on. Mm -hmm that I feel like another reason that I was just crying 9-11 is sad and scary. And like, I know that we, with COVID, we've had like literally thousands of 9-11s happen every day because of COVID, but it's like different because it wasn't a terrorist attack. So even seeing like this fictionalized version of what was happening in New York City, it still was like, oh my God, it made me like so sad and cry or like the voicemails. Cause I know that there are voicemails like that because of like United 93 and I'm sure people in the offices as well. Ugh, yeah, if you wanted to tell a 9-11 story, this is like a weird way to do it sort of, but it did fucking hit me even it's though it's completely fictional. <sighs> no, I don't know. Let's move on to the art because I was gonna say now I don't know if that actor I don't even know the little boy's name I don't think that he's probably actually on the spectrum. He see listen here now He's not an actor. He is a little boy that won kids jeopardy that um When they yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They auditioned like hundreds of kids and were looking forever and then they were just like look at this little boy on kids jeopardy It's him and it's like the only time he's really ever acted like he acted like did two other things other than this and like that's it he's just a person now cheers to that oh my god you know for not being an actor i thought he did pretty well i don't know maybe that's just literally how he is but he was incredible he was incredible he when he was telling a lie when oh i'm gonna give the art like i'm gonna give it a four honestly i'm gonna give it a four I'm gonna give it a four as well because they had some really interesting shots with like, I don't know what kind of camera it is, but it made things look miniature or they would do like the kind of tunnel vision thing. There was, I think some choices made that weren't so cookie cutter. Yes. And I, I thought they added to the story and Oscar's like perspective. The thing that like, I think was most unique about this film that like, ooh, he was a little autistic boy who made all his little projects the art department and the props department popped off on all the little things and the indexes and his flip book. Slay. It was so good. It was so good. Did you know who the grandpa was? Uh, his name is Max von S S Sindo Snowden. I don't know. He was nominated for Best Supporting Actor and he lost. Do you he... know who the grandpa is? I feel like I do, but I can't look him up right now. Yeah. If I do, um, I'll make you insert like a poster or something here with Heard. like a rev with a one word review of that movie from me. There was not a lot of Sandy in this, but I think that's okay. And Tom did fine, but this kid really just was great. We'll really visit this in question five, but like it almost didn't matter who the parents were at all. He did not look anything like them. I feel like they could have cast 
anyone else. 2011? 2011, I mean, I was aware of this movie. I'll give it a 3.5. Like, I didn't go see it, and I don't really know anyone who saw it. I don't think we started to make fun of it. And by make fun of it, I mean call it Extremely Tom and Incredibly Hanks until college. So, um, 2011, I was just like, I don't want to see that. I don't know. It didn't look fun. The joke title I knew this by was Extremely Sad and Incredibly Touching. And I knew about it from the book because I, I read like half of Everything is Illuminated and I never finished that. This like did not make a ton of money. It was horrifically mixed reviews. Seems like a lot of people wrote think pieces of how did this get nominated for Best Picture? This is one of the worst Best Picture nominations in years. And then they were like, if this is nominated and there are only nine nominees, why wasn't there a 10th nominee for like Girl with the Dragon Tattoo or even Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2. But apparently it was more Oscar rules that I suppose I'll have to Google and insert whenever we put this out. I don't know. I really, I don't think it's that bad. I can think of worse movies since then that have been nominated in Best Picture slots and maybe even uh, one or two that have won. Probably just one green book. This is not Best Picture. This is not Best Picture. No. Definitely not. That's Never correct. a million years. That, that is accurate. But today, I don't know, a two. Because yeah. no one is actively seeking this out, probably. But I, if you said the title, I think most people would be like, uh, is Tom Hanks in that? And you'd be like, yeah, it's called Incredibly Tom and Extremely Hanks. I know I just flip-flopped them. I I think I might even give this... I want to give it a 1. That's fine. I, I think I'm going to give it a 1.5 because the movie still comes up, but it also comes up because people are still reading the book. Almost every single thing that I could find was related to a, a review from years ago or about the book. There was one article on fatherly.com of if you want to watch a dad cheerjerker movie... This is a controversial film to watch. Why was it controversial? I think because people were like, oh, it's 9-11, and it's sad, and this movie at the time, blah, 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 and like, I don't know. If you were a parent looking for a tearjerker, <laughs> look no further. That's basically it when it came to the today for me. Obviously. Oh, you know what I'll say? Huh. Um, as far as today goes, if I wanted to rewatch Tom or Sandy, probably wouldn't choose this one. No, I mean, I would rewatch The Blind Side over this for sure. Holy moly, in the oeuvre of films those two have been in, it would no, not be this probably dead. wouldn't crack the top ten. No. So. Anywho, marginalized persons, you know, I'm going to give this a 2.5. 2.5? I'm going to give it a 3. Viola Davis and, oh, I literally always forget this actor, but he was, like, dressed in the French Dispatch, and that's what, he's, like, Mr. Black. Yeah, he's in Westworld. Abby Black is, uh, Viola Davis, and yes, they are, like, supporting roles, but they're not just, like, I don't know, they do help him. He visits lots of different people with the last name Black, but again, it's, like, they're literally all just, like, people he visits, so that's not great. Yes. And well, they're all people he visits, but, like, he met so many of them, and we saw so many people from different walks of life, different socioeconomic yes. statuses, and different ethnicities, and they yes. were never, like, correlative at all. Yes, he lives, like, in New York City, so there is, like, extreme diversity, and I feel like we got a little glimpse of that, again, especially, like, kind of through his, like, what, 12-year, 11-year-old boy, like, perspective. He's supposed I don't... to be nine. Nine? Okay, he's just really tall. Again, if he's like a little kid going out and meeting these people, but right. we got to see so, so much, and yeah, it was glimpses, so that's why I'm like, oh, it's not great, but it, it's something, sort of. This, it's not, it's not confirmed or denied whether or not the character or the actor of Oscar has autism, but you cannot deny that this is a film about an autistic boy. Right. So, like, that's sort of representation, but then at the same time, it's like, well, if that little kid is an autistic, then it's not good representation, but it's like, but it's something, I don't know, I don't know. There was also one person that he visited in, they, he was oh. like, of in, they were of indeterminate gender. And I didn't know if they had a, peep, a Pepsi or a VJ. And he just keeps going on and on. Of a J or a penicillin. Yes, that made me scream 
it made me die. There was even one moment where the queer community was on the screen. Better than 50-50, which had nothing. I don't want to give a three, but I, I, it's, it's almost. So I'm giving it 2.5. But Manson Family Disclosure, I'm going to say no. I feel like no. Unless you like didn't know about 9-11. <laughs> I think that we all do. But even if you weren't born yet, I'll say, because like we experience we experienced nine eleven at like f- six and seven years old. Yes, nine eleven. I don't want to say it's explained in the movie. He says multiple times, like because these random strange guys just flew a plane into the building. Like if you didn't know what nine eleven was, they do give you enough context to be like, okay, a tragic death event happened. Right. There's no scene in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood where Charles Manson is on screen and he's like, we should go kill Sharon Tate. Yeah. If that that had happened, I might understand why Sharon Tate was in the film. Yeah. So no Manson family disclosure. No. What is next week? I'm trying next week, next episode. Do you remember... I think it might be another special, to be honest. I think you're right. The next episode is a special. It's going to be a good one, and we hope you tune in for it. If you've seen either of these movies, if you like them, if you hate them, tell us in the comments. Share this with a friend who you watched with and say, extremely you and incredibly me. I don't know. Make a joke in the comments, or be nice. Make a joke in the comments, period. <laughs> if you are watching at this point, you have to comment something. You cowards. Comment which movie you think we are. Yeah, who's dressed as what? You have a 50-50 shot. But yeah, that's what we have for this time. So bye-bye. Bye. Oh, I did find, and this pissed me off. I'd like you to guess how much someone is selling an unremarkable photo of lightning for. $75,000. Ooh, okay, so you are over. <laughs> 700 but I was... <laughs> <laughs>